welcome to the Capital Discussions Roundtable. I'm Tom Nanamaker with our guest Hari Krishnan from liquidity.com. Um, before we get too far, a quick disclosure, the Capital Discussions is not a broker dealer or an investment advisor. This presentation is for educational purposes only. We don't know your situation and I have no way of knowing what level of risk is appropriate for you. We're not making any specific trade recommendations. The risk of loss in trading options can be substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to placing any trades. Hypothetical computer simulated trades are believed to be accurately represented, but for actual profit or loss may vary due to market factors such as liquidity, slippage, and commissions. And you can read our full disclosure at the bottom of any of our websites, and we'll put a trailer on this video, so just pause the video and read it if you like. So with that, uh, Hari, uh, welcome. Uh, first time been on the round table, and we've been chit-chatting before we hit the record button, but it's uh, nice to have you here. So welcome. Well, the pleasure is mine, and I hate to have to do this, but everything that was said in the disclaimer, I would wholeheartedly agree with. So um, any of the trades that I recommend here are to be taken at your own risk, and any of the simulations that I've run, um, I don't take any responsibility for any errors that might be in there. But with that, I'm happy to proceed. Um, I'm going to give a, a talk that's a little bit different from perhaps what you usually see, because I'm not that focused on any single structure here. But chatting with Tom, um, the impression that I get is that many of the strategies that you run in this forum are short Vega strategies or short gamma strategies, where you're either short the tails, so you're exposed in the event of a black swan, or you have a little bit of negative volatility exposure that you want to plug or um, account for just in case something happens in the market. And I think that dovetails nicely with the book that I recently wrote. Uh, the name of the book is The Second Leg Down. It was published by Wiley this year. So obviously I'm peddling the book a bit uh, with all the disclaimers I've given before. But I think there's a good overlap, as I said, between what's in the book and the issues you might face with the structures that you trade on a daily basis. So with that, I'll go into the presentation. Um, the first slide just has a picture of the cover. Uh, to lodge that in your memory. Um, but in terms of the way that I've approached this, I've focused historically more on institutional investors. And the experience that I've had in many years running money as a macro fund manager um, has been that while there are a lot of theoretically good reasons to hedge a long-only portfolio or a portfolio of risk assets, most people don't like to hedge in a bull market. And the reason they don't like to hedge is that they view hedging as a cost, ultimately. They view it as a line item in their portfolio. And when they see it consistently negative, they view it just as an unnecessary um, drag on their returns. So hedging is often viewed as a dog. And so even the most well-intentioned hedgers who wish to protect the, their clients' portfolios in an efficient and cheap way namely by buying volatility when vol is low, they don't get much of a mandate in those, in those situations. And it's only when there's a leg down in the market, and by leg down, I mean a, an initial sell-off. So you can imagine, say, the S&P dropping by 5% in a week or two. People start to worry, and institutional and retail investors have margin constraints, and they have the concern that the sell-off may follow through. And what happens then is that investors just start scrambling for protection. And when they do that, the cost of insurance goes up. As you know, the more demand there is for options in general, for buying them, the higher implied volatility goes. So if you take the approach of only hedging once there's been a leg down in the market, you'll wind up consistently overpaying for insurance. And that's a negative drag on your returns. Now, some sell-offs do follow through spectacularly. 2008 is a shining, shining example of that. But given that many, if not most, sell-offs do not follow through, portfolio managers give away some of their hard-earned alpha when they reactively buy options at the first sign of trouble. But they have to hedge, especially if you're a large institution or you're a hedge fund. At some point, you can't take the pain anymore, and you don't want your clients to be exposed beyond a certain threshold. So you have to hedge. And the, the idea then is... How can you hedge, assuming that volatility is, is somewhat rich, in a way that doesn't eat into your overall returns too much? That's what the book's about. And um, there's a little 
self a little pity party as people say um that i wanted to go into on this slide which is called the perennial whipping boys so if you are in the shoes that that we've been in or in the setting that we've been in where we've um run hedging mand mandates for various institutions um you get tarred with a with a, a kind of a bad brush namely that if you are a hedger um, you burn premium most of the time if you're long options. And if you're not doing that well in absolute return terms, institutions get impatient and you wind up trying to get cute with your hedges, reducing the um, convexity or the power in a sharp downturn. And that can ca ca cause problems if there is a major sell-off. Conversely, other managers feel compelled to chase every down move and they wind up getting whipsawed when there are... Um, oscillations in the market without any definitive trend. So that's my little um, pity party. And the umbrella term for this sort of strategy, for being a bear market strategy or a hedging overlay manager, is that you're taking maverick risk. And what's maverick risk? It's the risk of being wrong and alone. If you're wrong and you lose money, but everyone else has, people will tolerate that. But if you're losing money at the exact opposite time when people are making money, you have a bit of a psychological barrier to overcome. So given all of that, the best way to think about the book and the best way to think about the hedging strategies in the book is as an offset to what you already have. Don't view it in isolation, view it in conjunction with the strategies you're running. So if you're long a bunch of one by twos or you're long the Batman trade, which is long a one by two put ratio spread and long a one by two call ratio spread, um, these sorts of strategies can help you, can get you out of trouble if there's a sizable move in either direction over a short period of time. So um, in the book, basically what I do is I assume that no one's going to give you a mandate to hedge until there's some pain in the market. Not blood on the streets maybe, but there's some pain in the market. And as I mentioned, we know that volatility is not going to be cheap when an equity index or a risky currency or something sells off sharply. So how can we protect against further losses in a way that might not be optimal but isn't ridiculously expensive? How can we make the worst, the best of a bad situation? And the other major issue that I deal with in the book is, yeah, it's great to hedge because when you hedge, your entry timing point doesn't matter too much, but you still have to time the exit. You still need to know when enough is enough, when you, you want to take profits or take money out of the hedge um, and accept that your protection level is going to be smaller on the way down. And the book goes into a series of option structures that you can rotate into, rotate out of and into, that keep protection on, but act efficiently in response to the current regime. A big theme in the book is kind of the idea that every dog has its day. What does that mean? Well, any option structure you could come up with, however ridiculous it might seem at first, will have some market scenario that pays off for that structure. So there are some scenarios that are good for anything, and there's, there are some scenarios that are bad for even the best option structure you might have cooked up. So one of the important things from my perspective, as somebody who's run institutional money for over 10 years, is trying to find the right option structure conditioned on the prevailing market regime. That's a big part of the book too. So again, I'm trying to stick imprint this in your mind. That's the book cover. It, it's got a picture of um, a bunch of fireflies. And the idea behind that is that um, biological systems can synchronize um, in very unusual ways. In other words, fireflies, if they start lighting up enough, can start to emit bursts of synchronized light over time in a, in a way that seems far more powerful than what you would expect. In the same way, markets can sell off in a synchronized way far more rapidly than people would normally believe um, once their recent memory of a crisis has faded. So that's the point of that. Now, if I had to pick one slide that encapsulates most of what's in the book. It's this one. And again, it comes back to the theme of adapting to changing risk conditions over time. Um, the every dog has its day thing. Now, the way that we think about 
modeling the volatility surface. Just take the S&P or an equity index um, options chain as a starting point, is to try and model the sequence of moves starting from a sustained bull market, like the one we've been in, uh, to a severe and prolonged bear market um, over time to see how the volatility surface normally changes. Now, in the book, I give more evidence for this, but this is a teaser. Usually what happens is if markets have been rallying for ages, what you wind up with is low volatility across strikes and across term structures, across uh, tenors. So the skew is flat and the term structure is also relatively flat, maybe not in percentage terms, but in terms of volatility points. So long dated options are cheap. The skew is cheap. You can go um, anywhere on the surface and you don't have to pay too much. Now, if you believe that the options market is fundamentally different from the insurance market, where the insurance market, if, you know, insurance companies make money because if they can diversify their insurance claims enough, then the insurance that they sell will be statistically overpriced all the time. Then they should be able to extract an edge out of that. Whereas my view, our view on the markets in listed options is that yes, listed options are generally overpriced. They might be overpriced over a normal market cycle averaged over time. But there are times when volatility is cheap. And a time like this, I would argue, is such a time. And so if you wanted to hedge now, one of the best strategies you could engage in would be just to be a value buyer of options. Go out and buy a one year or two year or even longer dated puts on the S&P 500 or the Euro stocks or whatever index is your favorite and sit and wait. Why? Because you're buying lots, of, you're accumulating lots of Vega but your time decay is low. So your Vega to theta ratio is high. You can sit and you can wait and you're buying value in the volatility markets. You can do more fancy things too, which I can talk about in the Q&A in terms of offsetting some of your um, time decay with roll down, with, with the forward curve roll down, but I'll leave that for now. So that's box one. Box two is kind of, let's say there's a little bit of a sell-off. Let's say the S&P is down, uh, the S&P is down um, three or four percent in the next week. Um, in that case, um, you would expect that the short end of the volatility surface would move more than the long end. So there'd be the, the skew wouldn't steepen much, but one month implied vol for the S&P 500, let's say, would go up a lot more than one year implied vol. So the term structure would, ste would become a less upward sloping or perhaps even inverted. In that case, um, you want to do skew trades, in my view. So you want to be selling close to at the money puts and then overbuying way out of the money puts. That's a bit like a short one by two, but not at the money, a little bit further to the left. I'll go into that in the next few slides. Um, the next stage of the sequence is when the skew also starts to steepen. So investors are not only saying that short dated risk is relatively high, but also that the risk of an extreme down move is also increasing. In that case, it's better to skip the short end of the curve completely and then buy longer dated options because usually longer dated, the longer dated options market is relatively sticky. It requires a fairly sustained down move before it picks up. And in that case, you can go out and just focus on the long end of the term structure and buy value. Um, now, at some point, if there is a big enough sell-off, if the S&P has been down 10% in the last two or three weeks, or maybe it's been down for a few months, everything's pretty expensive. And the argument that I make is that suddenly weekly options become attractive. Now, there's a lot of controversy about how to use weekly options. There's a lot of debate as to whether the time decay in weekly options um, outweighs any benefits of them, but I'll argue in favor of them in the next few slides. And the final frontier in terms of hedging, you can think of it in terms of delta hedging or efficient delta hedging is to say, well, I can't hedge my options book with other options, which is the most natural and logical way to hedge. So I'll just go into the futures market or the underlying market and hedge directly. So it's a form of delta hedging, but one way to do it is to uh, follow trends. And what we found in our research is that shorter term breakout systems offer the best 
hedges against a short volatility options position. And again, I'll go into that in the next few slides. So there's a lot there. I don't want to bog you down with the details, but the point is that um, as market conditions change, the volatility surface for risky assets moves in a fairly predictable way. And at any state, you can identify a good hedge for that state, either in terms of low cost relative to protection offered, or in terms of actual performance on a forward-looking basis. And you don't have to worry about taking off a hedge. Instead, you can think in terms of rotating from one hedge to another based on the state of the world. That's something we've all map, uh, that I've mapped out in great detail, but um, glossing over a bit in this presentation. Uh, so I've kind of gone into some of these killer apps for hedging. Um, as I said, when uh, if volatility picks up a bit, but the skew's still flat, selling put ratio spreads can be attractive. Um, I, don't, I go into this in the book, but not really in the presentation. There are various VIX hedges that you can put on that are very efficient, that minimize the roll down of the, the normalized roll down of the term structure. Um, there's also the notion of using weekly options as a way to uh, supply an emergency hedge. The goal there is just to put a floor on your losses. So if you're panicked about your position, I don't recommend that you trade in such a way that you're seized by fear if the market shanks down too much. But if you're worried about a position and you still think there's tremendous value, there's tremendous edge in volatility terms, one thing to do is to just go and buy some weekly options, bite the bullet, pay a fixed cost, hedge for a few days up to a week, let's say, and then take a walk around the block, collect yourself, and then think about what to do with your core position. It's a way to put a floor, at least in delta terms, on your potential downside. Um, I talked about long dated options. And finally, trend following in global futures markets is kind of the final frontier because when you trade delta one, when you trade the futures instead of trading options, there's no explicit premium payout. So if you can come close to replicating an option style payout with a future strategy, while it might not be perfect, it is a um, statistically good way to protect while minimizing um, premium outlay. So those are the killer apps. Um, I wanted to talk about a, a little aside, which I find amusing. Um, and I think it's an important one though, because what it says is that um, sometimes you can find value in hedges, even when the market is generally gripped by fear. And the example that I'll go into is a two month one during the Lehman crisis. So it covers September and October 2008. Now, there are two charts. I'll show you the first one. It's a scatter plot. And it's called the first leg down. So in September 2008, the S&P was down 8 or 9%. It was a bad month. By today's standards, it was horrific. But by 2008 standards, it was just bad. Anyway, what I did was I took the stocks in the S&P. And I took the at the money um, implied vol for each stock. It was derived from a straddle, just an at the money straddle. And that's the X axis. And on the Y axis, I looked at the change in volatility points. So five would mean going from a, well, a five would mean going from a 15 vol to a 20 vol for at, an at the money straddle in the month of September. And I basically plotted the change in vol as a function of the at the money vol going into the month. And what you see is what you would expect. And I'll put my arrow over here a bit. The safer stocks, you know, the Johnson and Johnsons of the world, the Walmarts, whatever was considered safe, had on average a lower increase in implied volatility than the risky stuff. So you see an upward sloping regression line. And that's sort of reasonable. It sounds intuitive, namely that when people are nervous when there's a sell-off, there's a tendency to rotate from risky names to safer names. So you sell your biotech stocks or your high um, PE stocks or whatever, and you rotate to safer stuff. So you don't want the implied leverage in your portfolio if you're long only. Instead, you want to stay exposed but go to something that you think is safer. So what basically happened was that the safe stocks sold off less than the risky stocks. 
And you can see that from the regression line. But the really interesting thing is that if you had gone in and said, well, I'm still worried about a second leg down, a second phase to the sell-off, and you had bought um, protection on Walmart and Johnson & Johnson, which everyone else thought were safe, you would have made out like a bandit. And this is the evidence. I did the same study in October 2008. And you see a really surprising result, which is that the safer stocks going into the month at the end of September actually had on average a bigger jump in implied volatility than the risky ones. The riskier ones had already had a jump in risk, in market implied risk. The safe ones had a bigger jump. Why is that? Well, the way I think about it is that there are two phases in a sell-off. In the first phase, people try and act intelligently. So they move from things that are widely considered to be risky into things that are uh, consensus, on a consensus-driven basis considered to be safe. But when things get really bad, people just sell whatever they have. So there's a fire sale in the market. And buying protection in areas that are vulnerable to a fire sale can be very powerful. So if you go out and you want to buy protection in a generic sense, not on the specific structure you have, but against a systemic risk event, you'd be well served to buy protection on stuff that no one else thinks is risky. Why? Because if things get bad enough, uh, people will sell whatever they have. People generally, selling generally does not occur on a big scale because people want to sell. Okay, there are the bears out there, but in general, people sell because they have to. And there is a bias toward being long in general. And uh, finding pockets of crow crowded pockets in the market, which could be vulnerable to a sell-off in the event of a credit crisis can be a powerful thing. So that's the aside. Um, chugging along, back to the main story. This is, might be too technical, but I'll say it very briefly. Um, the one good reason for selling ratio spreads, I know that a lot of you do the Batman trade where you buy ratio spreads, where you buy an at the money put, let's say on the NASDAQ or the S&P and you sell two 25 Delta puts. Okay, that's statistically a good trade. I don't disagree with that. But it's a good trade because you're selling the stuff in here along the black line. And the view that we have or that I have is that while there is an implied volatility skew and the market does take into account the fact that negative surprises are more likely than positive ones and that tail risk is greater than a normal distribution would predict. Nonetheless, there tends to be excess demand for say 5% out of the money, six week S&P options relative to 10 or 15% out of the money options, especially in an environment like the one we have now. Why is there this bias? Well, as I understand it, lots of large institutions hedge by committee. So they sit around a room and somebody says, well, what do you think a, a reasonable downside scenario is over a six week horizon or an eight week horizon? And one person might say minus 5%, one person might say minus 10% and so on. And then what they do, which is uh, uh, the wrong thing to do, is they start averaging these downside scenarios. Now it's, it's okay to average alphabets, but it's a very bad idea to average extreme event bets or extreme downside bets because you wind up washing out the tail that you need to be worried about. And so I think there's excess institutional demand for say 25 to 40 delta puts on equity indices. And those are the options you typically want to sell. And now are the tails cheap? Are we living in a world like Nassim Taleb would outline where extreme events are underpriced by the market? I wouldn't argue that. What I would argue is that um, if you can sell stuff that you know is overpriced and then buy stuff that's unpriceable in such a way that you have some edge, then you have a great trade. You don't need to be able to price the wings. You just need to know that the totality of the structure that you're trading is a good one. So this is some evidence for selling the ratio spread. There's some good support for this. This is a simple study. Uh, basically what I've done here is I've looked at two regimes for the market, risk on and risk off. It's a bit fancier than what I'll say, but you can think of risk on as an environment where volatility is quite low or somewhat lower than normal. And risk off is when vol is pretty high. So there's been a sell off of some magnitude. Now what I do then is I say, well, if the previous week on the Friday close was risk off or risk on, 
I go out and just mechanically buy a constant maturity for constant four weeks to maturity put with various deltas, 10, 25, 40, and at the money on the S&P 500. And then I roll it every week. I roll into a new four week to maturity structure. You have to assume there's a flex option to do this, but it's just as good if you construct it yourself. Now, what you see is that none of these options do well on a rolling long basis over the past uh, 12 years. Um, but the 10 delta put even risk adjusted does better. Now, I haven't bought one 10 delta put, 125, 140, and 150. Instead, I've bought five times as many 10s as 50s, two times as many 25s, and um, five fourths as many 40s as 50. So that they're all holding the same delta, the same 50 delta at the point of um, reestablishing the hedge. And so what you can see is that in both risk on and risk off periods, the 10 delta, the 10 delta put even scaled is cheaper. It bleeds less. Now, in risk on periods, it's even cheaper because you're buying with a lower volatility level. In risk off periods, it's uniformly more expensive, but still the 10 delta is better. Now, then you have to address the question, well, okay, the 10 delta put even risk adjusted or delta adjusted is cheaper, but does it give you as much bang for the buck if there is a sell off? And um, I'll skip this slide because it's a bit technical. Um, ooh, I'm a bit jumpy. But in 2008, which is kind of the de facto crisis scenario, you can see that the 10 delta actually outperforms. So the P&L is sort of calculated on the assumption that you, every week you calculate the, you use black shoals, you use the vol surface, you reprice the option from four weeks to go to three weeks to go with a change in the spot, change in the time to maturity, a change in the vol surface, and so on. And then you divide the P&L in points by the index level and you come up with a weekly return. And then you just compound that return over time. You can see the 10 delta put actually did the best. Now, it may not have done the best if you had held to maturity, and that's a big point in the book. Um, holding to maturity isn't necessarily the way to trade options. You, the community here will, will know this as well, if not better than I do. And the payout at maturity is not the key payout. It's really the payout at the time that you're, you choose to roll or where your triggers hit and you do roll or take profits. And so for this rolling strategy, even if the 10 delta put wound up in the money relatively rarely, it still has a bigger repricing of risk and a more effective repricing of risk than the other deltas. It's a bit like um, what I've been told, which is that the price of hurricane insurance in theory should go up if there's a rainstorm. Now, there may never be a hurricane. All that's needed though, when you buy extreme or 10 delta is not that extreme, but fairly extreme protection is a repricing of risk. You don't need the options to wind up in the money. And so the 10 delta again looks the best of a bad loss in that scenario. So the argument I would propose is that if you are along a one by two put ratio spread, let's say, an open-ended downside trade and things get bad, plug your gamma hole, cut off the downside by just buying something that's extremely out of the money. Don't get cute. Don't say, well, um, that thing's never going to get reached. Markets tend to revert and so on. Just stay in the game and you'll cut your margin and um, you'll also at least have something on that you can play with in, case, in the case that conditions get worse. So the 10 delta is relatively good. Now, I didn't show the payout. This is probably the way you think of this. I tend to think into like a CTA in terms of time series performance, but if you're an options trader who's active, you probably think more in terms of, of uh, snapshots of payout profiles over time. Um, selling the one by two, here it's on the Eurostox 50 index, um, large cap European stocks, X uh, UK. What you see is that um, at maturity, you get the square root function payout. So it's a great trade from the standpoint of giving you tons of protection for a mega move, 
over let's say a one month horizon while you actually collect premium to put the trade on and the beauty of it is if the, if you something happens very quickly and vol picks up you suddenly slingshot into this curve which gives you r very rapid protection um, as at the money vol increases and as the skew expands the danger of the trade is that the market sort of drifts down so nothing happens vol doesn't pick up you start here the euro stock starts drifting down and you fall into this well but that's a worse of a problem for me than for you why because for me i'm hedging an institutional long only portfolio let's say so if the market is down four percent in a month and it just kind of drifted down in a really uninteresting way which again i think is unlikely statistically but if it did that then not only would the the end user lose money the client lose money but i would also lose money on the hedge because i would fall into this well every every option structure has an implicit cost that that provides protection so this is the cost it isn't premium outlay it's um rapidly increasing time decay if the spot drifts down so that's the payout now if you look at the p l of that strategy for you it might be uninteresting because you're trying to make money on a steady basis for me it's a great trade because it's a strategy that at least over this period uh 2006 to 2017 makes money um but more importantly, it has huge positive pickup, positive skewness in extreme events. So this is October 2008. This is the flash crash of 2010. Europe, I suspect. Um, this would have been, um, I think this was August 2015, which was a surprisingly large sell-off and so on. So this is a strategy that makes money over, over this period and has huge positive skewness. In my view, these are the true alpha generators in a portfolio. If you can find the holy grail, in my view, is a strategy that is positively skewed and doesn't lose money over time because you can glue that together with anything. I mean, you can sell options and capture risk premium elsewhere and still hedge, at least statistically, with a strategy that doesn't cost you to hedge. Now, it will appear it visually, if you, if you don't see the whole graph, if you only see, say, this bit, you'll say, oh, it's a terrible strategy because there's time decay. And there is time decay, even though you're collecting premium. But the point is that over the long term, you're actually getting paid, assuming that the future looks like the past, to put on something that gives you a lot of potential convexity, potential gamma, if the market really takes a leg down, a big leg down. So that's the short one by two. Um, and then from there, I kind of jumped to uh, weekly options as an emergency hedge. I think people who are short Vega have been pretty lucky over the past few years. I would have predicted, putting my macro hat, hat on, that there would have been a lot more flash crashes than there have been. Because even if you don't know everything about high frequency trading, which I do not, what I do know is that high frequency trading has the tendency to dampen volatility within a range and if and when the high frequency traders drop out, which they should for a big enough move, given that they're not heavily capitalized, um, then the market should have the potential to just race off in one direction or another. So I'm surprised that there haven't been more flash crashes. But if you have a portfolio or a structure on that you think is exposed, and suddenly the market is starting to go down, out of the money weekly options can be a great defensive play. Not only because they block out the downside over a short horizon, but also because in my view, they're statistically cheap. And just to give you a fancy phrase, they can scale into a move more quickly than any algorithm running on any server, no matter how close it is to an exchange. Um, okay, this the cynics will come out with a graph like this. They'll say, oh, we hate weekly options because uh, to buy them because, as you know, theta is rapidly increasing in a negative direction as the time to maturity goes to zero. So this is decreasing time matur to maturity as I go to the right and massively increasing theta in absolute value terms, but it's just becoming a lot more negative 
as the time to maturity goes to zero. So people say, well, why do I want to hold an asset or an option that decays so rapidly? Well, my view is that the compounding of many days of holding an option can outweigh the very sharp time decay near maturity. In other words, weekly options have already decayed in price terms. So you can buy a lot of them. You can get a ton of protection at a low price. True. Um, your protection will burn off quickly, but it gives you time to reshuffle everything else that you're doing. You don't have to take liquidity at the worst possible moments. And so I think of it as potential gamma. And um, um, what do I mean by that? Well, if you buy an option with one day to go and here's the spot, so the spot is much higher than the strike, you'll say, well, instantaneously, I've got no gamma. But the reality is a pretty small move can throw you right into a high gamma zone. So you can slingshot down here. So while the gamma instantaneously, while if you look at your Greeks, when you buy a five delta three day to maturity put on the S&P and you might say, well, my gamma is close to zero. So what's the point? The potential gamma in the event of a moderate down move can be very, very large. So there is a tremendous potential convexity in weekly options. Now, why do I believe they're statistically underpriced? Well, I'm basing this on a study that was done by some people by a group at uh, Boston University quite some time ago. And basically what they did was they said, well, we don't want to make any have any preconceptions about the way economics works. We will go out and we will measure the world, the world of finance. And we will use the notion of a scaling distribution as our uh, guide. Okay, that sounds fancy. Well, what does that mean in practice? Well, what they did was they took returns for various indices, the Nikkei, um, the uh, FTSE, the DAX, and the S&P, and they partitioned the returns over different windows one minute, two minutes, three minutes, one hour, one day, two days, three days, a week, a month, a quarter, a year, and so on. And they said, well, let's calculate the standard deviation over one minute returns. And then let's look and see how many multi-standard deviation moves there are over time. So over 10 minutes, you can see in this chart, you see lots of moves that are, say, over 10 standard deviations in size, down and even up. This is the crash of 87, one day uh, portfolio insurance crash. But you see a lot of other ones that are five standard deviations or more. Now, if you run a simulation, if you do a Monte Carlo simulation with Gaussian noise, so just normally distributed returns, you never see, you never see jumps more than three or four standard deviations. So the tails are much higher for 10 minute data than for Gaussian noise. Now what makes an interesting comparison is a real data set, which is monthlies. For monthlies, again, you see much smaller tails. You don't see any 10 standard deviation moves. Yes, the tails are fast, but they're not nearly as fat as they are over 10 minute partition widths. Now, why is that relevant to weekly options? Well, it's relevant because there's a break point. And these are hard charts, so I'll wait for the Q&A for this. But what the, base, the basic point in the paper, the papers, is this. The tails of the distribution of returns for major equ equity indices are fat for partition widths of four days and less, so intraweek, and then they rapidly become Gaussian as you go out more than eight or nine days. So basically, the fattest tails and the biggest potential for large jumps occurs intraweek. That's where you're buying your weekly options. And the probability of tail moves decreases for longer horizons. So from month to month, you won't see six standard deviation moves. But over one minute horizons, you'll see a lot of six standard deviation moves. And um, the tails are much fatter there. Now, you could argue, well, you could put on your, your um, contrarian um, hat as well and say, well, okay, that may be true, but if I need to put weekly options on in an emergency, 
and the market's cottoned on to this, they'll just reprice the weekly options in such a way that even though the tails are fat, they're, they're, that's been accounted for in the pricing. But what I show here is that the relative cost of a rolling weekly option strategy is inelastic to vol level, which means that even when volatility is high, in relative terms, you don't pay much more for buying four weekly options once a week and rolling them than you do buying one one month option with the same, in this case, 25 delta put. That's important because what it means is that when volatility goes up, the potential for a real sell-off has gone up because of people hitting their margin limits and brokers calling, calling, uh, taking people out. But the relative cost of weeklies relative to monthlies hasn't gone up. So you're getting into a strategy that allows you to plug the holes in your portfolio very efficiently, but you're not egregiously paying up for it because um, your vague is low. So the high implied vol, even if the term structure is very inverted, doesn't kill you. But by the same token, um, the econophysics or the statistics are working in your favor because they're saying that the odds of an outsized move have actually gone up over that horizon. So I think that's a very interesting idea. The trend following piece, I won't go into because it's outside of the, uh, outside of the um, province of what we're doing here. But what I will say is that there's certain types of trend following systems that do best in sell-offs. And if you can add them to your Delta hedging arsenal, that can be very powerful. That's in the book. So I'll just say that as a teaser. And to conclude, there's a lot of stuff here, but um, because I'm running on a bit. Um, we have time if you need to spend a few more minutes. Well, I, I like the Q&A, so I'm happy to jump to the conclusions if that's okay. Sure. Um, so the conclusions of the book and of what I'm trying to say are that um, the best way to hedge your existing option structure or your existing long only portfolio is to try and identify the best hedge for the market regime. In my view, you want to be rotating from long vol plays to long gamma plays as conditions worsen because you want to reduce your exposure to um, volatility when you buy, uh, buy options. So you kind of want to rotate from longer dated stuff to shorter dated stuff as conditions deteriorate. Uh, short ratio spreads allow you to benefit from the repricing of outcomes that may have initially seemed impossible. Remember the investment committee table? People saying, well, 30% is impossible, 10% is possible, so I'll hedge the 5 to 10% range in terms of strikes. Well, if the market does shank 10% in the first week, 30% suddenly in play, at least in the minds of that same committee. So there'll be a significant repricing of risk. So that's that's a good thing to have in your arsenal. It doesn't contradict what you're doing if you're a buyer of one by twos, you just do the short one by twos further out, or you do them with a shorter maturity. Uh, weekly options have a relatively high gamma to vega ratio. In other words, they have high convexity relative to vol sensitivity. That allows you to place a hard stop on losses over a short horizon, yes, but without much premium outlay. And that allows you to take the time to decide what you really want to do with your structures. Finally, trend following sidesteps the idea of buying options completely. There's no premium outlay, but it doesn't provide guaranteed protection in a choppy market or particularly in a flash crash where the trend, let's say, or the momentum of a given market is in the opposite direction um, of the flash crash move. So with that, I think I will... Um, will stop, but I will make one final comment because I forgot the final bullet point. If you know how to hedge, if you have a good arsenal or a good bag of tricks for hedging in a variety of regimes, you have a huge edge over other people because you can stay in the game long enough that you can then turn offensive and start doing some of these um, short skew, short volatility, relative value type trades um, when conditions get really bad because you're still in the game, you're taking profits on your hedges, you're able to scale in and out of your long positions more efficiently, knowing that you're not under pressure to liquidate. And that gives you a lot more freedom to do real risk premium trades over time. In fact, I would argue that the hedging in some ways is a bigger part of the alpha equation than the vol part because um, 
it allows you to do all this other stuff that is liquidity provision at the end at the end of the day. So with that, I'll stop for uh, Q and A. Okay, there's a chat. You should be able to see it. If I think you put your mouse up at the top, there's a, probably a uh, chat button. Oh yeah, so quite a few things here. Uh, let me double click on that here. Will a recording of this be available? I will leave that to John. Yes, I already answered John. So we are oh, recording. Lovely. Yep. Now, Srini had a question, which is, what's the typical cost institutions spend on hedging? Oh, that's a very good question. It very much depends on what their core strategy is, how much leverage they use, and how forward thinking they are. So um, a standard mandate for us would be to spend away 1% per year on hedges that presumably would pay out 5 to 10% at the portfolio level, at their portfolio level, for a moderately large drawdown in the S&P. Can I give an example of a hedge from Barrett S? Uh, sure. Um, uh, you have a structure on that is short volatility in, let's say that you've sold three month puts on the S&P because you think the term structure is a bit, a bit uh, steep. So you've sold three month puts. Um, there's an initial sell off in the market. Um, you're worried that your three month puts could wind up in the money very quickly. So you buy one week to maturity, 10 Delta puts to hedge your, your gamma risk. And uh, you roll those puts if the market continues going down, but um, you just do a one once only load if the market recovers. That may be a bit too simplistic. I go into a lot more details in the book. Uh, there was an earlier question here. Yeah, um... They asked, uh, what, let's see, the problem with that is market grinds up and long-term options will lose value real fast. That was earlier in your presentation. Yes, think... and yes, that's a good question. Um, I'm, my argument in the book is to use weekly op options reactively. Uh, there's a whole section on this. And the idea is that usually in the markets, um, you don't need to predict when to put on a weekly options hedge. What you need to do is protect stay in the game once there's been a bit of a sell-off by buying weekly options. And the reason for that, the rationale for that is that when sell-offs sell occur, they're usually not coming out of nowhere. Usually there's enough initial pressure on levered investors that they're forced out and markets start to sell off rapidly in a sequence of stops. So you don't need to be predictive when you get into a weekly option strategy. You don't need to load it all the time. You can wait and if there is enough um, of a sell-off and you feel enough pain in your position, you bite the bullet. Sorry to use so many uh, cliches. You bite the bullet and then you just go into the market and you buy some protection. It's a, it's a sunk cost, but it allows you to keep the rest of your portfolio in place. Uh, Baratess, are the puts I'm selling naked? No, the book is about buying puts generally, buying protection. What I'm saying though is that the stuff you might already have on is short. So this is a way to offset um, um, positions you already have on. So the, if you viewed the book in isolation, it would not be a huge alpha generator. What it is, is a way to plug any issues in the rest of your portfolio. Um, Another question, I'm currently leaning toward rolling my hedging into each of my trades. So a lot of work, but I will be protected from flash crashes also. Uh, one thing to, you can do there is not get too fancy, but just buy a silly strike put. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, if the S&P is at 2350 or 2400, you could buy a six month 1950 put or even a lower strike. What that does is it just gives you a floor on your potential losses if there is a very severe sell-off. So you don't need to be very active and trade uh, very short dated options. You can go out a little bit further, especially now when there's tremendous value going further, further out in time. I know that the term structure is upward sloping, but my argument is that you can get in now and you reduce the, the, the need to reload over time. 
How do I figure out re regime changes statistically? Yes, good, very good question. Um, well, what we do is we basically use a collection of implied volatility indica indicators. So we use the VIX, the implied vol of the Australian dollar, US dollar, or Aussie yen cross, uh, swap spreads, uh, emerging market sovereign bond spreads, and so on. We normalize them, we use a Z score. We aggregate them. And then we have an index, which is kind of a measure of cross asset class risk. We calibrate it so that the, the indicator is risk on about 70% of the time and risk off about 30% of the time. This was partly based on work done by Conquest, a major macro fund. Um, but it also makes sense because if you are an investor, you want to be loaded toward risk more often than you're out of the market. If the market does offer you a risk premium, you want to be in more than out. Now, the interesting thing about the risk index is not only that it's intuitively a good way to measure cross asset class risk, but also it's persistent. In other words, if you're risk on on a given day, odds are over 70% that you'll be risk on for the next month and vice versa. So we have a regime indicator that's pretty much a plain vanilla aggregation of implied volatility indicators across markets. Now, the trouble with the indicator recently, I hate to, hate to harp on the negatives, is that it's been risk on more often than ever in the past year. So there have been very few opportunities to flip in and out of different trades. It's been a very static environment. But over time, this indicator does tend to flip fairly often. Not over monthly or intramonth horizons, as I said, but over longer economic cycle type um, horizons. Dr. Krishnan, that's a bit of a, uh, very kind, but not, not necessary. What I see is the cost of 10 to one week puts, 10 one week puts. Yes, that's, that's true today. Yes, yes. Uh, if I were doing a prop trade, buying short dated straddles and selling longer dated straddles would be a great trade. Um, it wouldn't have worked recently, by the way, because vol has continued to stay low, but, um, I totally agree with that argument, yes. Given the relative cost of straddles or straight puts, um, buying and rolling is statistically a great trade, but you may have to wait a while before you really, it really kicks in. Yes. The risk of the market keeping closed is not one that I've faced very often in terms of um, the bigger markets. Now, it's true that the market makers do pull out if there is a major short very short-term move in a given market. But I don't think that um, eliminates your ability to trade intraday. Um, for smaller markets, that may be different. But for the major indices, at least over the last five or six years, I haven't found that to be the case. Yes, in 2008, it was very difficult to get in and out of shorter dated stuff. My presumption here is that most of you in the forum are not so big that you're constrained in capacity in the weekly options market. So I think it's a good thing to be able to trade. Um, I don't know what your frictions are, but um, I found that the frictions for an institutional macro trader are quite low. Ah, the 9-11 type thing. Um, well, that is one of the issues with weekly options. If you believe this econophysics, the statistics, the best time to buy is on a Monday, not to try and carry over from the previous Friday. And a lot of market makers do this too because they believe that the vol is overpriced given weekend risk. But weekend risk is something that you sometimes have to block out. So I do, I do understand your question, yeah. Have I considered that? I've considered lots of things, yes. So Rahul's question is a good one. Um, selling puts on leap options is a great strategy, but in this regime, I would say it's not so good because as I said, after a sustained bull market, Longer dated options might be relatively rich compared to short dated ones. But if you view things from a macro perspective over the cycle, they're cheap. So if you're a buy and if you take a more of a buy and hold directional mentality, um, I wouldn't be selling them now. But yes, there are times when you want to be a seller. And yes. did you see Steven's question about depending on one's portfolio value? Ah, uh, yes. Um, well, the study in the, in the book, the studies in the book 
focused on one to three months to maturity options for the 10 delta arguments, typically. Uh, the weekly stuff is a bit different, but um, how many to buy? Um, the basic thing to do is to first make sure that you've cut off your downside. So if you buy a one by two put ratio, you probably just buy one five delta or 10 delta put to hedge. Um, if you wanted to be aggressive though, you could do more. And I remember in 2008, there was a guy who, I think the market was around 700. And he put on a great trade, which is that he sold the 600 put and he overbought the 400 put. Um, so he did a like one by three. He took in premium, quite a bit of premium. I forget what the tenor was, but he took in quite a bit of premium, yet he was protected if there was a complete collapse. Um, so you, oftentimes you can make the argument that if there is a big sell-off, there are two things that can happen. Either there will be a strong reversal or the market will completely collapse. If you believe that, then perhaps overbuying slightly the 10 delta is a good strategy. But the, the sort of first pass strategy would be just buy one, just buy one of the 10 delta puts. Cover your one by two, uh, lock, lock down, um, block out the downside, but keep your vol, your short vol bias or short skew bias in play. Yes. Do I hedge 100% of the portfolio? Well, it depends. It depends. Um, the angle that I came at from the book is um, that the someone else is running the long book. Now, I do run macro programs as well. That's outside of the scope of the book because I do a lot of futures as well, systematic futures. But uh, for the clients themselves, they usually don't want 100% hedged. They just want a tolerable downside scenario. So if they're benchmarked against other long biased managers, um, they would want to be down, say, 15% if the rest of the market's down 20. That may require only a 50% hedge. It all depends. Most people don't hedge 100% if they're long biased institutions, but more options focused guys tend to hedge closer to 100%. Do I hedge 100% in the macro programs? No, probably 75% or so of the extreme downside. Uh, which means that I might be a lot less hedged in, in relative performance terms if there's a moderate downsize move. Looks like the questions have slowed down a bit. I'll just put another link in for the, the book. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Looks like a good one. So I encourage people to, uh, to get it and read it. That's very kind. Thank you. I'm sure I'll be one of them. So. <laughs> That's very kind of you, Tom. Um, if you ever need, any, if anyone has any questions later or subsequently, don't hesitate to ask. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to follow up. So. Oh, and there was a question I think you missed on asking about your affiliation with liquidity.com. Ah, yes. We have two sides to our business. One is a global macro hedge fund. I'm one of the fund managers. There's one other guy who runs the rates. I do the currencies and the volatility trading. Um, liquidity is the name of our research outfit because our, the firm originally was providing global macro research based on analyzing central bank balance sheets and private sector credit expansion over time. We initially funneled that into our money management business. We have about 400 million under management in the US. It's all in global macro and volatility. So liquidity is the name of the research side and cross-border capital is the name of the money management side. I'm predominantly on the money management side, but I am involved in the research a bit too. Fantastic. Well, uh, we're right at an hour and I, I don't normally like to go past that to be considerate of people's time, but as people are saying, great presentation, really appreciate you coming on and uh, hope we can have you back in the future. It would be my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone, and uh, I'll get this posted and send everybody the link. So thanks again. Mm -hmm.